The 2015-2016 Medical Dental Legal Update continues with Corporate Structure Benefit Planning and Tax Efficiency for the Healthcare Practice, featuring David B. Mandel, JD, MBA. Mr. Mandel of Fort Lauderdale, Florida, is a former practicing attorney and is a principal of the financial consulting firm OJM Group. He specializes in risk management, asset protection, and financial planning, and has authored a number of books for doctors, including For Doctors Only, A Guide to Working Less and Building More, Wealth Protection MD, and The Doctor's Wealth Protection Guide, endorsed by five state medical societies. Mr. Mandel is a frequent national speaker, and his articles have appeared in over 100 publications, including over 30 medical specialty journals. You may contact Mr. Mandel at 877-656-4362 or by email at mandel at ojmgroup.com. Hello, I'm David Mandel, principal of the OJM Group. And today we're going to be speaking about fi reducing financial stress for physicians and reducing that specifically through ideal corporate structure and tax reduction. Now, as any good former attorney will tell you, there's a couple things to keep in mind as we go through this talk. First of all, this should not be, cons be construed as legal advice or tax advice specific for you. It's important to understand that some of these ideas may be very applicable for each of you. Some of them may not. And the only way to know that is to get specific advice from someone on your situation. And I encourage you to do that. I hope that today's talk will give you some ideas to think about and take home so you can then uh, look at your situation and see how they apply to you. Now, we're only going to have about an hour together. And while you'll get some good ideas in this hour, it's just the tip of the iceberg on this type of information. And so I'm proud to make an offer to you as the AEI participants to get one of our books for free. I've been speaking with AEI, with AEI for a number of years and we've made this offer and many of you have taken advantage of it and learned and read and gotten more educated on these issues on your own. So you can see here, there's a number of books we've done for physicians. We've written books for doctors for almost 20 years. We have books for physicians in any state. We have some books specific to four different states, and we even have some materials that are CME certified and that are co-written by physicians of certain specialties. At the end of this talk, you'll find out how you can get those for free, and I encourage you all to take advantage of that offer. So in today's presentation, we're going to cover a number of topics. The first one is physician financial stress. Now, unfortunately, it's probably something you don't need much education on, as I've found working with over a thousand physicians that many of them today are more financially stressed than they have been in the past. We're going to dig deep and, and look at a couple of different surveys and understand where that come from, and then we're going to start to talk about how we could alleviate that. And the areas we're going to try to uh, delve into to alleviate some of that stress is first, corporate structure. When you choose a medical practice, if you're in private practice, uh, the type of entity you choose and how you're going to be taxed is important and it can make a big difference on your long-term financial uh, picture and it also if you know you're doing the right things may reduce some financial stress the second area we're going to look at is benefit plans and this is something that really is very important for both physicians in private practice but also employed at large institutions i'm going to point out some of the options there as well so we're going to look at qualified retirement plans and non-qualified plans Finally, we're going to touch on uh, a topic called captive insurance companies, which are applicable for practices of any size uh, that also can have a tremendous financial impact for the physician for the long term. And each of these things, I think, if implemented and if they make sense for you, can help you reduce your stress of how am I getting to retirement, uh, am I doing enough to save, and am, am I feeling good about where I'm going financially as I practice. Now let's take a look at a couple of the numbers. This first slide deals with a study of about 2,000 physicians. Now it's a couple years old, 2011, so it's even before a lot of the uh, changes with healthcare reform have come into place, which I have found, and you probably agree, has increased the stress level for physicians. So I think these numbers may actually be a little, le a little lower than what they are today. We'll see on the next slide a study that is uh, up to date. 
So in this uh, study, uh, we uh, what was looked at was the financial stress level of physicians. And what the study found was almost 90% felt that they were moderately or severely stressed on a day-to-day -day basis. That's not good. And there's probably other speakers at AEI and certainly other resources you can get on how to potentially reduce that stress from just a day-to-day -day, uh, work-life balance and uh, other recommendations that, that can be had. Uh, most of them uh, from this survey felt like they were more stressed out than they were before, and I would submit that the numbers today uh, are even higher given the changes in the law and some of the financial uh, restraints, reimbursement cuts, uh, the, the requirements for electronic medical records, et cetera, et cetera, that you're very familiar with. But I think what's most relevant for us today is when they asked the physicians what are the top three areas that they uh, would help them uh, reduce stress, number three was improved finances, compensation, and reimbursement. Well, that's what we're going to focus on today. Certainly, I'm not going to be able to tell you how to get Congress to improve, improve your reimbursement. That's for another forum and other discussions. Uh, and that really ties into compensation as well. But what we can do today, and what I am uh, uh, going to talk about, is how you can make yourself a little more financially efficient, a little more tax efficient, a little more savings efficient, so that you can help meet your financial plan, which is important that everybody have. And if you're doing that, I found the physicians who feel like they are doing those things and who are uh, created a financial plan and sticking with it, that stress level goes way down because they know they're on a path that they can measure every year and every quarter and it's not up in the air whether they're going to meet their goals. Now this next slide uh, is, as I said, from a study of 4,000 physicians in 2013 and 14. And what's interesting about, of the 4,000 physicians, uh, about half of them were employed for large institutions and half were in private practice. So I think it's a very good uh, sample of what the general feeling of physicians are. And it was conducted by the AMA and their insurance wing. And not surprisingly, what they found was the number one goal of, financial, of, of physicians from a financial point of view was having enough for retirement, providing for a good retirement for them and for their uh, spouse or partner. Not surprising. But yet, what I think is not really surprising to me, but it may be to you, is that yet half of the physicians felt like they were behind where they should be or where they'd like to be. Uh, I find that every day, and maybe half of you in the audience feel that the same way. And that's unfortunate, and I think maybe a couple of the ideas today could help that, but also being proactive about planning and sitting down with a, a team that can help you build a plan for yourself for your practice, for your personal uh, career, and a financial plan for your retirement, that's the key. So about half were behind, and only 6% said they were ahead of schedule. So you know that's a lot of need, I think. And the other thing that the, the, um, that the uh, survey found was that physicians admitted that they had a, a lacking of financial knowledge in a lot of key areas. Uh, we're gonna talk about some of those today, but certainly that's why the books, I think, are important, because if you wanna be educated, and that's the first step, then whether it's our books or other books or learning is crucial because once you understand your situation, your options, then you can take proactive steps and that stress level reduces. Now let's jump into the meat of the uh, talk and uh, the uh, opportunity for you to actually reduce financial stress and do some savings. The first thing we're gonna talk about is corporate structure. Now, I'm not gonna try to teach you everything about corporate tax law for uh, medical practices in five minutes, but I think we're gonna to touch on the highlights. And if I'm sitting in your shoes as a practicing physician, uh, then this is important, uh, and this is what uh, uh, is something you might wanna take some notes on. So what are your options? If you want to, and I recommend highly against it, but there are physicians out there who don't have any legal entity for their practice, if they're gonna operate as a solo practice, that's called a proprietorship. You're operating in your own name, I've given other talks at AEI, and certainly there's materials in our book on asset protection. That's not today's talk, but it's a terrible way to operate because all of your personal assets are on the hook for anything that happens at the practice. But you don't have to file a tax return. Everything flows into your uh, personal return. Again, that's not ideal when we start talking about other options. If you have partners and you operate that way, it's called a general partnership. You may have a partnership agreement, but there's nothing filed with the state. Again, that's not an ideal way to operate from a protection point of view. In fact, it's the opposite of ideal. It's, uh, it's the worst way to operate. Uh, and it also really doesn't provide you any uh, proactive tax options. So if you see yourself in either of these situations, you really want to put a gold star next to uh, 
talking to someone about improving that. Now, another, the second option on this slide is a limited liability partnership or a limited liability company, LLP or LLC. Now, my company, OJM Group, is taxed as an LLC, taxed as a partnership, as this second option is. But you don't see this m very often for medical practices, and, be, and that is because the main tax benefits of these entities tax as partnerships is you have flexibility in how you can use different uh, deductions and write-offs and um, uh, losses and profits. And there's also some options for things like uh, um, uh, stock options and things you don't see in medical practices very often. However, you do see this ownership form and this tax form very often for uh, doctors who own a piece of property. In fact, I would submit that most of you who have gotten advice about owning a building, maybe where the practice is, you probably have that building set up in an LLC tax as a partnership because that may be places where you want to share uh, profits and losses or deductions in different ways. So it's not necessarily bad for a medical practice, but there's not really any proactive tax savings. Probably a better tool for ancillaries, like maybe a surgery center or perhaps a piece of real estate. Now, if you're a solo practice, you could also be what's called an LLC tax as a disregarded entity, if you're one person. I've seen that a lot, actually, for solo physicians. I don't like it, though, because while your benefit of a disregarded entity is you don't have to file a tax return, you have an entity that's formed in your state, in your state capital, Secretary of State, you have a legal entity, but yet for tax purposes, for the IRS purposes, you're what's called disregarded. So everything flows through your return, so that disregarded entity that entity, LLC in this case, doesn't need to file a tax return. So what are you saving? You're saving the cost of preparing a tax return. Well, what is that? Well, that depends on your CPA, but it shouldn't be a tremendous amount of money, especially when you think about they still have to calculate all the profits and losses anyway. It's just going to flow through to a schedule on your return. So all the calculations need to be done. It's just, is the return going to be filed separately or part of your return? Now, you're giving something up for that. And typically, when you're, what you're giving up is a lot more valuable than the cost of the return. And what are you giving up? Well, this gets into looking at the two major forms of practice entities for medical practice across the country. Again, I've worked with a thousand physicians across the country as clients, and I would estimate of that thousand, about 75% to 80% are either an S-Corp or C-Corp. It might even be as high as 85%. So the, all the things I've mentioned already maybe make up 10 to 15% of uh, different practice entities. So overwhelmingly, S-Corporations and C-Corporations are what your options are today and should be, really. So let's look at the number one. The number one option for a medical practice is to be taxed as an S-Corporation. Now, an S-Corporation doesn't pay any tax. It's what's called a flow-through entity similar to the partnerships I was mentioning before. There is an entity, it does file a tax return, but all the income flows down to the partners. So if you have five partners, each of the five are gonna get their 20% share of losses and gains. And the real tax saving that you can get in an S corporation is you only pay the Medicare tax, we're not talking about income, everybody's paying the income tax at the same level, but the Medicare tax, which now is 3.8%, potentially, depending on your income, and it's unlimited. So it doesn't matter how much money you make, that 3.8% goes on all of it. That, if you have an S corporation, is only um, uh, levied against your compensation. What you take as a distribution out of that S corporation is not subject to that tax. So let's just use a quick example. Let's say I have a physician who makes $500,000 a year, obviously a high number, but not unrealistic for many specialists. If they take it all as compensation, like they'd have to in all the other uh, uh, methods I had talked about before, or even under the C-Corp method, which I'll talk about in a second, they're going to pay that 3.8, let's just call it 4% for calculation purposes, that 4% on all 500000 So that's a, a $20,000 a year bill on the Medicare tax. But the S corporation, the rule is you have to take a reasonable compensation. Well, what's reasonable compensation? We've worked with 1,000 physicians and all of their CPAs across the country, so I think we have a pretty good sense. Let's use this rule of thumb today. Again, happy to talk with you in more depth. But let's look, look, look at the rule of thumb that you could hire somebody to do the same work uh, as a specialist um, uh, and pay them uh, a salary. So maybe you could hire someone out of fellowship that could see patients, that's licensed to do what you do, for only $200,000 a year. Again, still a great salary. Well, that means 
applying that to yourself, you could take $200,000 as compensation. That's really what you're getting paid to do the work. And $300,000 is distribution. That's really what you're getting paid for being a successful business owner. And if you do that, you're saving the tax on $300,000. Well, that at 4%, again, to use the numbers, that's $12,000 a year in tax savings. You might not say that's going to relieve a lot of stress. Okay, might pay for a family vacation or two. But what's really more important about that is if you do that over a 20-year, 30-year career, and you start to extrapolate with some reasonable growth rate, we're talking about potentially a half million dollars or more of retirement savings. That does reduce stress. When you start to see that on your financial plan and you realize that that is an extra amount of money addition to what you're saving today that you're going to have for your retirement, that allows you to start to feel less stressed about seeing every patient, billing constantly, and being overworked. So it can make a big difference. This is why most practices, I'd say about 55, 60% are taxed as S corporations, but yet many times, even when they have an S, they're not being, uh, taking advantage of that opportunity. They're either paying it all as compensation, they're being too aggressive and not taking enough reasonable compensation while they'll lose on an audit. And so it not only has to be the right structure, it has to be the right use of that structure. And I encourage all of you to make sure that you understand how you're being taxed today and if you're using the right structure. Now let's talk about C corporations. Now I'd say about 10 to 15% of medical practice, especially the older ones, are taxed as C corporations. Now if you're a C corporation, you can't play that Medicare tax savings game. You have to take it all as compensation because you don't want dollars left in the corporation at the end of the year because a C corporation does pay tax. Unlike the S where it all flows through, if you leave profits in the C corporation, it will pay tax and tax will be due then. Then if you want the money out as a distribution, as a dividend, you're going to pay dividend tax. Okay? So generally, C corporations zero out the books at the end of the year and they do that by paying extra bonuses and compensation. So you lose that Medicare tax savings play. However, there are certain write-offs in a C corporation that you can't do in an S corporation. I'll give you an example. Uh, my father is a radiologist. When he left a, a large group practice where he was chief to do some locum tenens work, one of the things I wanted him to do was get long-term care insurance for him and my, and my mother. And for all of you, it's an important thing to get. We're not going to cover it today. And it's an important thing for you to get for your parents and in-laws so they don't come in and live with you. So that's what I was thinking. Let's make sure my parents have the right long-term care insurance. Well, it's much easier and much more advantageous to write off the premiums for long-term care insurance through a C corporation than it is through an S corporation. So I recommended when he set up his own entity to do some locums work to have that taxed as a C corporation. It's an easy example of how C corporations have specific write-offs that S corporations don't. So everyone of these entities has its pros and cons. Some of them, to me, have a lot more cons than pros. Some, like S Corp and C Corp taxation, have uh, the opportunity to do some tax planning and reduce some financial stress, and one's not better than the other. You just have to look at what you have and make sure it makes sense. The other good news is you're not committed. So if you're an S corporation today, you can change to a C as long as you haven't changed in the last five years. Same thing if you're a C corporation today, you can change. If you're moving from one of the other entities to one of these uh, S and C Corp, <clears throat> you can do that at any time. And it doesn't mean changing your tax ID number. It doesn't mean a disruption. It just means changing how you're taxed. Of course, you want to work with a tax advisor to look at your specific situation. Now, the other concept that's important to understand is you don't have to have just one entity. I use OJM Group as an example, my company. We have three principles. We have six different entities. We have entities taxes. S corporations, we have entities taxed as C corporations, we have entities taxed as partnerships. And each one of those provides a tax benefit to us. Does that mean you should have six different entities? Probably not. But it does mean that you could look at the option of having more than one. There's no rule or law that says a medical practice needs to operate as one entity. In fact, you might have an entity that is the professional entity, like the PC, that is the one that reimburses, that goes for reimbursement, that gets paid, that is the professional entity. You might have a marketing or an operational or a management entity. Uh, many physicians and practices already have an entity for their real estate. You might also have one for equipment. It really depends on your goals and the bottom line tax benefits you will get. But the key concept is to diversify your tax treatment and also protect assets.
Now, when we look at this slide, this gives you a visual depiction of the multiple entity structure. Okay, you can have the main practice entity taxed in one way. You could have the marketing or operational entity taxed another way. Not even on this slide, you could have an LLC for real estate taxes, a partnership perhaps. And so you can get as complicated or as simple as needed to reach your goals. My point today is really that you have different buckets. They're taxed differently. They have different tax uh, uh, benefits. And really the opportunity there is there to maximize what you've got. So the question for you really is, first of all, do you know why you have the corporate structure you do? Some physicians will say to me, I'm not sure if I'm an S-Corp or a C-Corp. Uh, can you help me look at that? Absolutely. Uh, more importantly, of course, is I am what I am. Does it make the most sense? Most practices you either come into, they already were how they uh, were taxed before you got there, and now maybe you have some input on them changing, or you set one up yourself, you weren't really thinking about long-term tax benefits, you just did what made sense today, and you uh, wanted to um, see if that's as optimum as it can be. Well, that changes, okay? So we gotta look at it today and say, does this still make sense? Is there a way I could save more taxes? Is there a way I could be more financially efficient and maybe protected, and thereby reduce some financial stress and maybe get some extra savings you're not taking advantage of? Now let's turn to the second area where I think we can have a real impact on physician financial stress, and that's on benefit planning. And again, this is <clears throat> very relevant for both physicians in private practice, but also employed even at large institutions. Now when I ask a group of physicians what a retirement plan is, most of them think of their qualified retirement plan, which is a 401k, profit sharing plan, could be a pension plan, a hospital could be a 403b, and certainly that is part of a retirement plan. But if I can leave you with one main concept today uh, that you can take home is the concept of tax diversification. And this is, is just as important for the employed physician as it is for the physician in private practice. Because what we don't want is to rely solely on our quote unquote retirement plan on qualified retirement plan assets. And you're going to see about that as I go through the taxation and what your other options are. Let's look at this slide that delves in a little deeper on the concept of tax diversification. On the left side of the slide, the green bucket, these are your traditional qualified retirement plan assets, your 401k, 403b, profit sharing plan, even for these purposes, even though technically they're not, SEP IRAs, simple IRAs. The way these assets are going to come out in retirement are they're going to be subject to ordinary income taxes. Now the benefit of them, as we're gonna talk about in the following slides, is you get an ordinary income deduction going in, and that's terrific. But as we show here, you're gonna lose depending on where you live and the tax rates at the time. And again, we'll talk in a couple slides of what tax rates have been and where they might be going. You probably should estimate, and we do when we're working with clients, to lose 40 to 50% of those assets in taxes. Now, if you're lucky enough to live in a state like I do in Florida where there's no state income tax, maybe that comes down. Maybe we all benefit and tax rates are actually lower in retirement than they are today. I would bet on that. But that's the issue with qualified retirement plans. They're terrific going in, but they're onerous coming out. And what we don't want is our clients completely hedged to that position. And as you see the next couple of slides, you're going to see why. Now, almost all clients do have some hedge against that qualified plan tax treatment by using the middle bucket. These are assets like our portfolio, our home, uh, maybe other real estate, uh, stocks and bonds, uh, um, artwork even. These are tangible assets or intangibles that when you sell them and turn them into cash for retirement are going to be subject to capital gains taxes. Now again, we show about a 30% um, uh, uh, tax hit on those assets coming out. There's a range. It could be anywhere from you know, 15, 20 up to the high 30s, depending on your state and your income level at the time, et cetera. Those are subject to capital gains taxes. Again, in a couple of slides, we'll look at the history of the federal capital gains tax. But keep in mind that if your state has state income tax, states generally don't diversify or, or uh, 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 distinguish between capital gain and ordinary income. So if you have an 8% ordinary income tax in your state, Chances are when you sell that asset, you're going to pay that ordinary income 8% on top of the federal capital gains tax. So you got to keep that in mind. That's how rates can get pretty high. Now, on the right side of the chart, the uh, blue bucket are what we call overlooked assets. Now, they're, they're not overlooked by all clients, but these are assets that are not going to be subject to tax when you take them out. 
And a big theme that we work with clients on that I want you to take away is to be well diversified and have some of your long-term plan in those assets because I truly believe that if you do that and if you're diversifying not only your wealth on a allocation level which our investment team does large cap small cap stocks bonds commodities all of those things you've probably heard of but if you're also diversifying from a tax point of view your stress level is going to come down what kind of assets are subject not subject to tax on the way out municipal bonds um, Roth IRAs, paying the tax today, converting to a Roth, growing that tax-free, pulling it out tax-free. Uh, cash value life insurance. Um, Non-qualified plans, which often fund into that kind of product. Uh, annuities are subject to some taxes, but they're not as onerous as the first two buckets. So there are a number of different choices you might have to see how that kind of asset class can work in your plan. Now let's dig into the qualified retirement plans because I'm sure almost all of you have such a plan. I find 90 to 95% of doctors in all specialties have some kind of qualified plan or simple IRA. Now in the qualified plan arena, there's two categories. Okay? Qual there's defined contribution plans, uh, plans and defined benefit plans we'll talk about. The asset protection is excellent generally, not in every state, but in most. You have to cover all, your, all of your eligible employees, which is necessarily negative because you want to keep good employees productive and, and at your practice and, and happy. On the other hand, it's a real cost. And I have had physicians come to me and say, I don't have a qualified plan anymore because it got too expensive for my employees, especially when I started to consider the taxes on the way out. As I mentioned, you get a full deduction on the way into these plans. They grow tax-free. Those two things are tremendous. You're going to pay ordinary income on the way out. And also, if you want the money before you're 59 and a half, you're going to pay a penalty in addition to the taxes. And there's pretty onerous taxation if you leave the dollars in there um, and you have subject to an estate tax, subject of a different talk. Now, let's look at qualified retirement plans, the defined contribution plan subset. And this, as you probably can tell by the name, the IRS or more accurately Congress, determines the amount of contribution you can put in, and then when it grows to, whatever it can grow to. 401ks, 403bs, 457 plans, et cetera. You can see the limits in 2015. One of the benefits of defined contribution plans is there's tremendous flexibility. So if you have a great year, you want to fund the maximum, you can do that. You have a year that's less uh, great, you put in less, et cetera. Okay? So there's a lot of flexibility there. The key in having the right plan, just like anything, is proper planning and looking at the design. Does it make sense for you? Maybe it did years ago, maybe it didn't today. A lot of the times we're looking at clients' plans and making, and making some uh, important recommendations, they can actually put away more given that what their plan is, or they could put less away for the employees, or they're paying too much in turnover uh, uh, to their investment advisor, or too, too much uh, on the fees to uh, the uh, TPA. The key is to examine it and make sure it still makes sense for you. The other subsection of uh, uh, qualified plans are what's called the defined benefit plan. These, again, we don't define the contribution. It's an actuarial calculation based on your age and income. And it then calculates how much you can put in today based on a projected future uh, retirement income. As you might imagine, depending on your circumstances, you can put a lot more away into a defined uh, benefit plan. In fact, if you're uh, saving later in life, you don't, haven't accumulated a lot in qualified plans, and uh, you put in a defined benefit plan, you might put in $150,000, $200,000 or more a year in defined benefit plans, getting a deduction on all of it, reducing the taxes on all of it. We have clients who are doing that. But because of that actuarial calculation applies to you, it also implies to the employees. So you don't look like a very good candidate for a defined benefit plan. If you are a younger physician, you have a bunch of employees who are older because they're going to have very high contribution levels. But you do look like a very good candidate if you're an older physician or you don't have many employees at all, regardless of your age. We have some doctors, and I want you to hear this, who are employed at large institutions. Okay? They're employed, but yet they have some other income streams. Maybe they do speaking. Maybe they do some industry work for surgery uh, uh, products, et cetera. And so they have other income. They teach. They create an entity, and then because they're the only employee of that entity, because they don't control the large institution where they're employed as a physician, they're al allowed to set up their own qualified plan. And by using a defined benefit plan, we have clients who have $100,000 going in as a consultant, and yet almost all of it coming out as a defined benefit plan contribution. 
So that's something that could be beneficial for any physicians who are employed at large institutions but still have some outside sources of income. Again, planning design is key, but also commitment is key because unlike the defined contribution plan, you don't have flexibility. You're basically telling the government, this is the plan I'm going to do, that's why you're getting the actuarial calculation. It's very difficult to then terminate the plan or start to underfund it, you could be penalized for that. So it's not just planning, but it's also commitment that you need in a defined benefit plan. Now SEP IRAs are different than um, qualified plans officially from a legal point of view, but they work similarly in like a defined contribution plan in terms of the amounts and the flexibility. Um, and so those can be, make sense for clients. Uh, but the asset protection is not as strong in some states as qualified plans. As an example, California, uh, IRA is not as well protected as uh, defined contribution plans. So that's another factor you have to think about in determining what kind of plan makes sense for you. But for all qualified plans and for the SEPs, you have um, this taxation, which is full deduction on the way in, tax-free growth, and tax uh, at ordinary income rates on the way out. So what you're really doing is tra trading today's tax rate for tomorrow's tax rate. And we don't know what tomorrow's tax rate is. So that's a bet with a lot of uncertainty. That's why diversification is so important. I use my father as an example. My father uh, is still practicing part-time as a radiologist, but I looked at his tax return from 1977 when he was chief of a, uh, of a department in Massachusetts. His marginal rate, not his effective rate of how much he paid, but his marginal rate, the highest rate on his last dollars of income at that point in 1977 was over 70%. That's right, as we'll talk about, tax rates used to be above 70%. And so that wasn't even including Massachusetts or Rhode Island state income taxes. So when he was contributing to the profit sharing plan at that radiology practice, he was getting a deduction at the marginal level at 70%. Now, like all good New England physicians, he lives in Boca Raton, Florida. And he's able to take the money out. He has to take it out because he's over 70 and a half. Minimum required distributions has to take it out. And he's paying no state income tax because Florida doesn't have a state income tax. But now we have a maximum federal rate of 39.6. So that was a terrific, terrific bet for him. He deducted at a very high rate in the 70s plus. He's taking it out in the 30s. Okay? The question is, what about us who are working today and saving? What are rates going to be in 10, 20, 30 years? We don't know. Let's look at this chart. This chart shows you the highest marginal federal tax rate every 10 years on the 10th year, so 1920, 30, 40, 50, uh, since the uh, federal income tax, this is just federal, came into uh, existence in 1914, uh, so about 100 years ago. And you can Google up the data points, but you don't have to write this down because it's in the books, which hopefully you'll be getting for free. What you can see is that for most of the post-World War II era, the highest marginal rates were above 67, even 80 percent. Okay? Now, it's not apples to apples. They could write off a lot of uh, things we can't write off today. Credit card interest, passive losses, et cetera, like I saw my father's returns. And also the uh, uh, income levels to get to those rates were relatively higher than a lot of physicians have today. But still the point here is even though we're at 39.6 and that's gone up as you can see with the fiscal cliff deal a couple of years ago, even though we're at 39.6, um, we could go a lot higher and still be below the mean in a historical perspective. Now do I think rates are going to go up to 60, 70 percent? No, I do not. Okay, there'll probably be a revolution if that happened. But do I think that rates can trickle back up into the 40s? I certainly do think it's possible and I don't want my wealth or my client's wealth completely hedged uh, against that possibility. Okay? I want them to understand that tax rates may go up, use qualified plans, use them significantly, often maximize those, but make sure you're diversifying against it. That's really the point. So what's the one main way that most physicians and clients like me diversify against that tax treatment? Well, it's using sort of investment capital gains type assets, securities, closely held businesses, maybe the surgery center interests, maybe artwork, commodities, et cetera, real estate, of course. Now, if real estate is part of your retirement plan, but is to get taken rents from rental property, which a lot of physicians like to use, remember that's gonna be subject to ordinary income, not capital gains, okay? But selling a property, that's gonna be subject to capital gains and you might even get a benefit uh, at least today we have a benefit on our primary residence. You don't pay capital gains if you're married up to $500,000 of gain. So there's a tax-free way to pull out money. We just don't know how long that rule will last. 
So these are important assets. We manage at our firm over $300 million for physicians across the country. We're helping them reduce the taxes on these types of assets on an ongoing and long-term basis. But yet, these are subject to these kinds of taxes, and they're important and should be part of every physician's plan to help reduce their uh, financial stress. But in this slide, you can see the history of the federal capital gains tax. Again, this is just federal. You have to put on top of this your state income tax. You can see that uh, in the 1970s, you also had a very high um, capital gains tax rate. In fact, it's higher than, uh, uh, really much higher than it's been since 1990. So from 1990 to 1940 or so, you had a much higher rate. The last 20 years, it's come down. It just came back up with the fiscal cliff deal to 20% on a federal level. Now the ACA tax of 3.8% can be levied on top of that, plus your state tax. So I think for a lot of clients, 30% is a reasonable number to assume those assets will be taxed at when you turn them into cash. Now, to diversify even against that and reduce stress for long term, you want to start looking, as I mentioned before, as the blue bucket assets that don't have tax on the way out. Roth IRAs, non-qualified plans, 162 bonus plans, life insurance as a retirement plan. I'm going to del delve into one type of plan for two minutes here, two or three minutes, that, again, can be used at a practice, okay, at a private practice, but also can be used just under different nomenclature, same economics, outside of a practice to be done personally. So even employed physicians can put something like this in place for themselves outside of their employment. Okay, now I'm calling this a non-qualified plan because in this context, I'm talking about it in terms of a uh, medical practice. There's no limitations on contributions. It doesn't interfere or conflict with any qualified plan, whether it be a 403B at a hospital or 401K, et cetera. In a practice environment, the owners can vary how much they participate. I could put in uh, uh, $100,000 a year. My partner could put in zero. It's fine. And it doesn't have to be uh, offered to employees. So there's no employee costs at all. How it works from a tax point of view is how you'd expect if it's going to hedge against the qualified plan. You pay taxes today, no tax deduction on it, but you get tax-free growth and tax-free withdrawal. Similar, in fact, to a Roth IRA. So you might think of it, quote unquote, not officially, but quote unquote, as a unlimited Roth IRA. But it acts as an ideal hedge against future income and capital gains tax increases. Now let's look at a case study. I should say that this case study might apply to you or might not. Okay, your circumstances uh, dictate whether this type of planning makes sense. This is why it's so important to learn more, contact a firm like us, sit down with somebody who understands your situation. But here's a real example from a client of ours, 45-year-old physician in Ohio. We showed them $100,000 a year for 10 years. You could make this 50,000, you could make it 25,000. The numbers are just indicative to show you uh, uh, their round numbers. Now we showed them what we show every client, doing this idea or not doing it. So not doing it for him was paying the tax and giving it to our investment firm to manage or another investment firm, okay? So we assume six and a half percent on both sides. Six and a half percent if he does the non-qualified plan, six and a half percent in an investment account. You could argue with that and say it's too high, too low, et cetera. Happy to talk with you, contact us and we can show you numbers that are different. The point is we also showed 1% in investment management fee. Some clients we charge 1%, some we charge less, some we charge more. We assume 20% in short-term rates, 80% long-term rates. Again, you could argue with those taxes, but I think that's a pretty accurate portfolio. We assumed his actual tax rate, because we had that in his tax return. His marginal rate was 39.6, his 6% state tax, okay? We also assume the capital gains tax staying the same in the future, about 30 years, at 20% with the ACA tax. You could say that that's conservative or aggressive, et cetera. And then we showed distributions at age 65 a year for 20 years to age uh, 85. So what we wanted to show to the client, just like I'd like to see, is what does it look like doing it versus not doing it side by side? And if you look at that, what you see is on the left side, which is paying your taxes, giving it to an investment firm like ours, paying some tax along the way, paying some investment fees along the way, you would generate 2.2 million of after-tax retirement distributions over those 20 years. Now, first thing I gotta tell you is that's terrific retirement there, and that's the power of saving, right? Albert Einstein said one of the you know, uh, eighth wonders of the world financially is the, is the value of compound interest. Well, this is that working for you, even in an investment taxable environment. 
it's powerful. Again, you could reduce those numbers to 50,000 and have reductions here, but the point is the same. But on the right side, the same rates of return, but you're increasing your uh, after-tax retirement distributions to 3.7 million over that 20-year period, an increase of over a million and a half dollars on an after-tax basis. That's like having another two, two and a half million in your qualified plan, in your 401k, 403b. That is huge. Now again, 100,000 a year for 10 years may be a big commitment for many. You can, again, make these numbers smaller. It doesn't matter. The concept is a lot more distribution on the right side in the non-qualified plan than on the left side, business as usual, paying your tax and taxably reinvesting it. Now, why is that? We've said that 6.5% is the same rate of return on either side. Well, the reason that is, is because of expenses. In the non-qualified plan, we have a lot less expenses than we do in the taxable investment plan. And the reason that is, is you're not paying tax on the growth, you're not paying tax on the way out. Very simple. So when I ask clients one question, these numbers start to make sense and they start to really consider it. Are taxes an expense? If they say yes, then this type of planning makes a lot of sense for them. Not for every client, certainly, but for a lot of clients to consider. And again, I'll make the point for the third time. I'm ex giving you this example here as from a client who had a private practice and did a non-qualified plan out of their practice. But this also can be done, same concept, no tax on the way in, but tax-free growth and tax-free access outside of a practice environment. So for you employed physicians, and I know more and more uh, uh, doctors are becoming employed, obviously in our client base and throughout the country, this still can be done. And it's a great supplemental retirement plan for those who are putting in whatever they can at their 403B, but are really missing what they used to be able to do when they were in private practice. So it's something I'd encourage you all to investigate. So the conclusion on benefit plans, Realize the tax bed of your qualified plan. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do one. I have a qualified plan myself. I've had one for most of my career, okay? But I do very consciously put dollars away every year in the other buckets to hedge against that. So when I get to approaching retirement and as part of my written out financial plan, I know that wherever tax rates are in the future, I'm gonna have flexibility. I'm gonna be in control of being able to pull it out of the bucket that is most advantageous. If it turns out income tax rates go way down, then maybe that's when I pull out the qualified plan money. If it turns out income tax rates are much higher, maybe I leave that in there and pull it out of the capital gains or the non-tax bucket. But I'm diversified. That gives me less stress. And I think for most financial, uh, for most physicians, having a real plan and Thinking through this tax diversification concept can also help reduce their stress. Now let's talk about small captive insurance companies for a couple of minutes. Of all the tools that I talk about today and that I've really worked on with clients from the beginning of my career about 20 years ago, the small captive insurance company can be the most powerful in terms of the tax benefits, the long-term financial benefits. But like anything that powerful, it can be complex and it's not for everybody. In fact, I don't have a small captive insurance company myself at our business uh, because they take a, a very large financial commitment. So for those of you watching this, there's probably a couple that it might make sense with, but I will tell you I've seen more and more interest on captives from physicians over the last five years. That's why I still want to talk about it. And in fact, what I've been seeing is a number of doctors coming together to create a captive and share the cost because that's really usually the limiting factor of why clients don't do it. They love the potential, but it's just expensive tool because you're creating a real legitimate insurance company. So why would one create a captive? Certainly the tax and financial benefits, but it also has to be based in risk management and asset protection. Having the captive protect the practice and other businesses could be uh, uh, the real estate, it could be a surgery center, ancillaries, have it protect those from potential claims. Okay? Now, under the tax code, and you can see the tax section here, 831B, since 1986, which we're approaching 30 years now, there's been a tremendous tax benefit for that type of company. If it's a small property and casualty company and it takes in less than $1.2 million per year in premium, it's tax exempt on that premium income. And 
may take a second to absorb, and I know you're not tax attorneys, but the idea that you can have a for-profit company that you can own, like a medical practice or a surgery center or a piece of real estate, or in this case, an insurance company, and it doesn't pay any tax on its income legitimately under the tax code, that's pretty powerful. So the question is, how do you make that work for you? And in the next slide, I'll show you a diagram. But a little more background. Uh, this 831B company, there's thousands of them operating in practice today. It's been made better by different code sections uh, and, and changes to the law over the last five years. But I do want to point out also that there is some more scrutiny from the IRS. So while you're having positive PLRs, you can see on that slide, means private letter rulings. That's the IRS publishing a, uh, essentially a, a ruling on a specific taxpayer and saying, yes, it works in this circumstance. And we see those, and we see hundreds and hundreds of new captives being set up around the country, all in the U.S., in states like Delaware or Kentucky or South Carolina or Hawaii or even, I think, uh, uh, Utah. Uh, many states have uh, passed new legislation to allow small captives. So uh, while you're seeing the states getting more involved and being more proactive, while you're seeing the IRS uh, uh, giving out uh, positive private letter rulings, we also see more scrutiny going on here. That's something to be aware of. So there's a big range of how clients, or I should say how practitioners are implementing captives. We at OGM Group don't really have any skin in the game because it's not something we do. But if you're seriously considering looking at a captive, I highly uh, uh, recommend you contact me because there are players out in the marketplace that I think are doing it much too aggressively and will get dinged by the IRS, either in the short term or long term. And then there are folks who are doing it very successfully with successful audits of their clients who are following the code and the regulation, what the IRS says is uh, legitimate. So it's an area that is important that you'll probably read about it's in our books that can work really well for a practice and even a, a, a number of business, uh, physicians coming together, but it also has to be done right and conservatively. Now, how does a captive work for a medical practice or a medical uh, organization? It's an insurance company that simply is insuring that practice or that organization. And a lot of the largest medical practices in the country, hundreds and hundreds of physicians, have set up captives because they don't want to give away the profits of their malpractice insurance to large carriers. They want to risk, uh, manage their risk and own that captive and own their own insurance profits. And that's important, okay? But whether you're a large practice or a small practice, the concept is the same. The insurance company is essentially owned by the same physicians or owned by the practice, and it is writing insurance to that practice to cover the risks. Now, what types of risk and what types of policies? Many times, in the large institution space, it's malpractice insurance or some portion of it. In small physicians and smaller practices, we typically aren't doing malpractice, but other types of risks. I see the lawyers setting them up for risks like um, loss of a key contract. So you have a key contract with a hospital. What if you lose that? Big financial risk, you could have a policy against that. What if you are audited by the healthcare uh, finance uh, board, uh, Medicare? Your defense costs in uh, defending that audit or any losses, you might be able to uh, uh, have a policy that defends against that. Uh, loss of a uh, licensure or defending of a licensure with a state health care commission. Uh, any of these types of uh, risk, uh, embezzlement. I've seen clients who have captives who had an embezzlement uh, policy actually have to claim on that. And that's, a, that's really important. You want policies that are unlikely but still possible because you'd like to see some claims over time. I know the IRS would if they ever see an audit. They want to see, was this real and are you really claiming on these policies? So they may be sort of what you consider, as I mentioned the slide here, Lloyd's of London type policies. They could also be policies that fill in where your current insurance ends. So you have one three malpractice policy with a $25,000 um, uh, gap, um, uh, self-insurance. You could have a policy that goes into that deductible and covers that 25,000 or goes above the one three limit. You don't have insurance on that today, why not get it from your captive? So there's lots of different types of policies. Think of them as Lloyd's of London, but you want them to be legitimate in that you hopefully will have a claim on them at some point. It legitimizes it from a tax point of view. Now, 
What are the key roles in setting up a captive and being able to get those tremendous tax benefits? Well, the number one, two, and three roles are the law firm that sets it up, the actuarial firm that determines the pricing of the policy. Because if a business is, or a practice is ever audited, one of the main things the IRS is going to want to see is, is that policy real? Was it priced properly? Yes, you can have a policy that defends against healthcare audits, but if you're paying $200,000 a year in premium, is that really a legitimate uh, premium for a solo physician practitioner. I'm not an expert, but it sounds pretty high to me. So it's typically not a lot of high premium uh, 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 policies, but them stacked on top of each other, 10, 20, 30 policies, but they have to be priced by an independent actuary. The third key people are the insurance managers. As I mentioned, anytime I recommend a captive to a client or tell them to consider it, they have to do it in the U.S. these days. There's plenty of good states that have uh, good jurisdictions for captives. And you need an insurance manager licensed in that jurisdiction. So whether it's Kentucky or Wyoming or, or Utah, et cetera, and it doesn't mean your practice has to be there. We have clients in California that have a Kentucky captive. That's fine. But you have to have a solid insurance manager that's going to handle the audits, that's going to handle your business plan, because you've got to get a stamp of approval as a license from an insurance department every year to be uh, in business. So those three keys, those three areas are key. Well, our role is often is to manage the assets inside of captives in a tax-wise manner to help clients with benefit plans to get out uh, dollars out of their captive or even exit strategies. So to conclude on small captives, it's a great tool that can have a tremendous financial impact on the physicians who use them for their retirement and thereby reduce stress, but you've got to do it right. If you're a practice of three to $5 million in revenue, you're probably a possible candidate. If you're smaller than that, you probably would want to get a couple of docs together. And if you're part of a large institution, you may already have a captive or maybe something to discuss with the key managers of the practice. It can provide tax, it can provide asset protection, it even can provide buyout and buy-ins because like a piece of real estate, you could have younger docs buy into the captive and when you exit, they could buy you out. So it can have a long-term benefit from a financial and tax point of view. Now, just a minute or two on our firm, OJM Group. Our goal is really to work with physicians and help them build wealth and protect it, and thereby really reduce financial stress, which is the topic of today's talk. And hopefully you've seen a couple of ideas today that you can take home or at least investigate further to see if they make sense in, for you and your practice. As you see this slide, there are a lot of areas we work with physicians on, and I just pulled out a couple key ones today, and I've been fortunate enough to speak with AEI in the past and hopefully in the future to delve into other places. But the key for you is working with a team that has the comprehensive nature and that works with physicians and understands you so that you can start to get a handle on your financial picture. At our firm, we've worked with over a thousand physicians in 48 states across the country. And we're pretty unique in that we've written the books, we have this experience with physicians. We have folks who have background like me as a former attorney. One of my partners is a CPA, uh, financial, insurances, benefit plans, et cetera. It's a multidisciplinary approach. As a doctor, you can think of it as like a multi-specialty firm. And one thing that I think ties into this, and then we'll get to the conclusion, is when we're working with a practice and they qualify, we'll come in and look at benefit plans, tax reduction, uh, uh, non-qualified plans, et cetera. And if we can't show either reduced costs or tax savings that quantify to at least 200% of whatever the consulting fee we're gonna charge, if we can't show that, we'll refund the fee. And that gets directly into reducing financial stress because if you know that you can work with a firm that can help you improve your ROI and get a real quantifiable measure, again, that's chipping away at putting dollars more away, being more efficient, having a better handle on your financial picture, which inevitably will reduce your stress and hopefully make the practice of medicine more enjoyable. Finally, let's talk about next steps. As I mentioned in the beginning, this is just an hour of our time. I've touched on a couple of subjects, but the education for you should really continue. And we're happy to be partnering with the AEI and providing our books to you for free. Not only do we have the books, we have um, every, every month we do free webinars, we have a free e-newsletter, and you can get all of that for free. And the way you do that is you go to our website, ojmgroup.com, you can sign up for the newsletter, you can see our webcasts. If you want the books, you can feel free to email me or if you have a question about the talk, something I didn't cover, something you wanted to answer, call me at the number on the screen, email me at the, at the address on the screen. And if you want any of our books, go to ojmbookstore.com. Uh, 
And very simply, you'll see a pricing on the book, because our books do sell for real cost, $19.95, $29.95. But if you go through the process, when you get to checkout, you use the AEI code, AEI, you'll get it for free. So whether you want any of our books in hard copy, if you're a Kindle user, if you're an iPad user, you can get those books for free, and I encourage you to increase your education, get a better handle on your financial options, and I think that will help you reduce your financial stress. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to hearing from many of you. That concludes another in a continuing series of programs on medical malpractice, risk management, health care law, practice management, and selected clinical topics. Presenting was attorney David B. Mandel. 